All right, morning, everyone. Good to see all of you. If you'd like to open your Bibles to Luke 14. One thing before I begin the sermon, I'd like to invite you to mark off the weekend of December 11th. I think it's going to be a special weekend. We have the marriage conference on Saturday, but then the following day, that Sunday, there's a pastor, a friend of mine, David Eddy, who said he was going to be staying in. We're having a pastor's meeting on um, Friday. About 15 to 20 pastors are coming together with their wives. The wives will be in the parsonage and the pastors will be in the fellowship hall. And some of those pastors are staying through the marriage conference, and one of them said that he was going to stay through Sunday, and that's David Eddy, and I asked him if he would teach Sunday school that Sunday, and Scott Brown will be delivering this sermon. And so I just really want to invite you guys to come out that weekend, try to set it aside, um, come to the marriage conference. It's not even really a WCC marriage conference. It's being held here, but it's more of a church and family life conference that uh, Scott's coming out to with his wife, and they're basically putting it on. Um, but we said we wanted you guys to be able to attend for free. So we're going to reimburse church and family life for all of you that attend. And so please be sure to register. We have a limited number of seats. And I don't want to think that there's 30 couples coming and then suddenly 50 couples come out that Saturday. And so please go. If you have any questions about registering or using the coupon that we provided that allows you to register for free, let myself or, or Audrey know. Uh, but we really need a head count for that. So, all right. Tell this morning's sermon is brought into Jerusalem. Sunday morning's work on our way through Luke's gospel verse by verse. We find ourselves at chapter 14, verses uh, 12 through 14. That's as far as we'll get this morning. If you want to go ahead and stand with me for the reading of God's word. Verse 12. Jesus also, he, he said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. You may be seated. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, uh, what a gift it is to us. We thank you even uh, for corporate worship and the privilege of it being preached so that it can wash over us and work in our hearts. I have no idea what's going on in each person's life as they came here this morning, but what a blessing it is to me that you did. And as I labored in my office over this message, you knew what you wanted each person to hear, Lord. I'm thankful that I don't have responsibility to try to minister to, to people outside this church. There's this, this congregation that you have given me, each of these people who are tuning in now, and I pray that this would be a time that you speak to them, Lord, that you would give them the conviction, the encouragement, the blessing um, from your word that they came here to receive. We think about any unbelievers who might be here, and I pray that you would open their hearts to the gospel, that you would save them, Lord, grant them uh, repentance and faith, in Christ, and I pray that you would just use me as your vessel, Lord. Bring to mind those things you'd have me share, uh, even if they're not in my notes. Just let this be a time that you, um, that I, I'm empty, Lord, to your will, and for you to speak uh, through me to your people. Let me be your mouthpiece, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning's verses pick up right where the previous verses left off. Just go ahead and look back with me at verse 1 to get the context. So there was a Sabbath, one Sabbath, when Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, and they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before Jesus who had dropsy, and Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees. And so this morning's verses um, take place uh, the same place that these verses uh, took place in the house of the ruler, uh, at, the, at the house of this ruler of the Pharisees. And there wasn't just this ruler there, there were some number of other Pharisees there, and it says some lawyers were there, and they had invited this man with dropsy. And you remember, why did they invite the man with dropsy? Was it they pitied him and just wanted to bless him with a nice meal? No, they wanted to put him before Jesus because they wanted to trap him to see him do something uh, on the Sabbath that they continue, considered sinful. And so if you were to walk into this luncheon, it would make sense to see all of the religious leaders there. It would make sense to see Jesus there because he was a prominent individual that the religious leaders would invite to a luncheon like this. But it would really make no sense for the man with dropsy to be there. He was not someone that they would ever uh, invite to a meal like this because they saw physical affliction or suffering, especially diseases or handicaps like this man had, as a sign of sinfulness or a sign of God's punishment 
on a, on a person. We obviously know that not to be the case, but that was the thinking with these religious leaders in Jesus' day. So they saw this man with dropsy as, as someone separated from God that they would want nothing to do with. They would never invite him like this. And this morning's verses, the reason I kind of review is this morning's vlo- verses flow from that thinking. Th- this, these verses really serve as a, as a, there's application for us, but they serve as a rebuke to the religious leaders basically about people that they would or would not invite to a meal. And so Jesus looks and sees that they would never, well, typically never invite someone like this man with dropsy to a meal. The only reason they did this one time was to trap Jesus. And so from that understanding flows the verses that we're looking at this morning, basically about who we should and shouldn't invite to meals. So verse 12 It says, Jesus said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, you should invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Basically, you should invite people like this man with dropsy, but not so that you might trap someone like they were doing, but because you um, care for people and it's a manifestation of your, your love for Christ that you would you would love others. And then he says, you'll be blessed if you do so, because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And this brings us to lesson one. Show kindness to those who can't return it. Show kindness to those who can't return it. Now, this is an example of hyperbole or exaggeration, or in other words, this uh, is an example of not being able to take Jesus as literally as he sounds. If you do, you're going to have a whole bunch of friends and family who are upset with you because you never do what with them? Huh? Yeah, you never invite them over, right? And so it's not that literal. You're going to have people that say, why don't you ever invite us over for holidays or birthdays? And then you say, well, I'm sorry, Jesus told me not to, right? So that's not really what's going on here. But he is uh, commanding us to show concern or care or love for those people that we know um, can't, not only uh, will not, but would be unable to repay us. He wants us to be kind to those people. Uh, But then notice the words, I mean, here's kind of an interesting, even though Jesus says you won't be repaid, let me ask you a question, do we end up being repaid? Because he does make that point. He says, you're not going to be repaid on earth for that, for that favor you show to those people who can't repay it, but you are going to be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now, there's a lot of liberty with um, sermons simply because there's no instruction in God's Word about what they, you know, have to look like or not look like or how many verses to get through or, or not get through. And so you can go these different directions, and that's why you're praying as a pastor about what God wants, wants you to share with the congregation each week. And, and this week, I'll just I be candid with you, I could have went further. These verses do continue through verse 24 with this discussion of the marriage feast and inviting the lame to it. But I just felt deeply burdened to show you an account of the, in the Old Testament that um, incredibly prefigures what Jesus was saying here. And one of the reasons I want to do it, besides the fact that we're spending so much time in the New Testament as we go through Luke's gospel, is I think it's important for us to remember who the Old Testament is primarily about. If you can grasp this, it can completely change the way you look at God's Word. And what I mean by that is it's very tempting to think that the Old Testament is primarily about Abraham, or it's primarily about David, or it's primarily about Noah. And sadly, there might be Christians who spend their whole lives under that impression. But let me just ask you, who is the Old Testament primarily about? Christ. It has always only been secondarily about those other people. It is primarily about Jesus. It is God's revelation of his son to us. And as I read these verses this morning, I was, uh, this past week, I was so moved to share this morning how, how in, uh, clearly I see Christ being revealed before he preached these words, the fulfillment of them through the life of David. We've talked many times before that the Old Testament, it provides examples of New Testament instruction. Let me say it one more time. The Old Testament provides examples of New Testament instruction. That's not my opinion. First 
Corinthians 10, 6. These things in the Old Testament took place as examples for us. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, These things in the Old Testament happened as an example. And so we should see, be able to see the examples in the Old Testament of the instruction that is later given to us in the New. Now, can anyone think of an Old Testament example of what Jesus taught right here? When you read Jesus' words in verses 12 through 14, can you think of anyone in the Old Testament who did exactly what he said, inviting the poor, the crippled, the lame to a feast? Can anyone think of someone who showed kindness to someone who could not return it to them? Because there is a perfect example of this in the life of David. In verse 13, if you want to circle the words, when you give a feast, invite the poor, crippled and lame, and go ahead and write Mephibosheth. And if you can't spell Mephibosheth, just put 2 Samuel 9, okay? (laughs) But circle the words, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and write Mephibosheth. Or just put 2 Samuel 9, and then go ahead and turn to 2 Samuel 4. We will get to chapter 9, but we have to look at one verse in chapter, chapter 4 first. So in the ancient world, when a king received the throne and he was not a descendant of the previous king, what did he do with all of the descendants of the previous king? Or another way to say it is when a new house or a new dynasty is established, this king is not descended from the previous king, what did this new king do with all the descendants of the previous king? He executed all of them because all of the previous king's descendants stood as the greatest threat to the establishing of his throne. And so it's completely customary in the ancient world when there was a king who was not descended from the previous king to execute all the descendants of that previous king, or basically to do all he could to destroy the house or dynasty of the previous house so that his house or dynasty could be established. And there's examples of it in Scripture. Here's just one of it. Baasha became king of Israel in Nadab's place. And at 1 Kings 15, 29, when Baasha became king, he killed all of the house of Nadab's father, Jeroboam. He did not leave to Jeroboam's house anyone that breathed until he had destroyed him. And so when Baasha became king, he was not descended from Jeroboam, and he wiped out every single descendant of Jeroboam so that his house could be established. And even up to this point in 2 Samuel, we've only read about two individuals connected with Saul. One of them was Abner, and the other one was Ishbosheth. And what happened to both of them? They've been executed by this point. And so, with that in mind, King Saul and his son Jonathan, they end up being killed on the battlefield. And this Uh, empties the throne or leaves it vacant. This paves the way for David to become the new king. Now, Jonathan, Saul's son Jonathan, he had a son named Mephibosheth, and he is the last descendant of Saul. And so, Mephibosheth has this very strong legal claim to the throne, and because of that, he poses the greatest threat to David receiving the throne. Uh, And if you're familiar with especially um, the early chapters in 2 Samuel, you know there was a uh, very intense struggle between the house of David and the house of Saul. And so it wasn't something for David to take lightly that Saul's house could pose a threat to him. When the news comes that Saul and Jonathan have been killed, uh, Mephibosheth is five years old at this time. He's not caring for himself. There's a nurse that's caring for him. And she receives the news that Saul and Jonathan have been killed on the battlefield. And she knows, um, because of her familiarity with the way the ancient world works, that Mephibosheth's life is immediately in danger. danger. And so she picks him up and she flees with him, with this young child. And then look in verse 4, 2 Samuel 4, verse 4. Jonathan, the son of Saul, he had a son who was crippled in his feet, and this is how he became crippled. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan, this means the news about their deaths on the battlefield, came from Jezreel, and Mephibosheth's nurse took him up, and she fled with him, and as she fled in her haste, he fell, and he became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. 
And so when the nurse fled to protect Mephibosheth, perhaps either she dropped him or she stumbled, but something happened where he, he was injured and he remained handicapped or crippled for the rest of his life. And this becomes some of the, this begins some of the beautiful typology that we will see through the rest of the account, and it brings us to lesson two. Mephibosheth was condemned to die because he was descended from Saul, like we're condemned to die because we're descended from Adam. Mephibosheth was condemned to die because he was descended from Saul, like we're condemned to die because we're descended from Adam. Now, let me ask you to think about something. Take your minds to the ancient world and what we've been talking about here. Why were the descendants of a previous king condemned to die? Was it because of anything that they had personally done? No, they were condemned to die simply because of who they were descended from. Similarly, you're condemned to die because you're descended from Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in Adam, all die. Now, when we read the scripture, and this kind of goes back to how we should or shouldn't view the Old Testament, because we're proud, because we're selfish, I mean, because it took centuries of human history to, to stop thinking that the sun revolved around us. I mean, just that idea that we would think that the sun revolves around us, we kind of do that with the Old Testament, where we think that all of these great heroes are us. You know, we're David killing Goliath. We, we want to be Elijah on, on Mount Carmel. Let me invite you to understand that if you're someone, you're Mephibosheth. You're not David. You're not the hero of the Old Testament. Don't try to be the hero. The Old Testament is not about what you've done. The Old Testament isn't a celebration of you and your accomplishments. God didn't write the Old Testament so that we can feel good about ourselves or, or be the heroes of the stories. The Old Testament about, is about what Christ has done for us. Goliath would be the devil. He would be sin and death. David would be Christ having that victory on our behalf. We're, we're, we're the scared, fearful Israelites <laughs> that are cowering, that are afraid of death, as Hebrews says. Don't insert yourself and, and try to be the person that gets all the glory in the Old Testament. Let all that glory and credit be given and reserved for God. You're Mephibosheth. He was someone who was unable to walk because of what? Because of a fall. Spiritually speaking, we are unable to walk with God because of the fall. Keep this typology in mind and turn to 2 Samuel 9. So verse 1, David says, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? So Jonathan was David's fiercely loyal friend, seemed to be one of his best friends throughout his life, uh, on par, maybe even greater than, than the prophet Nathan or Ahithophel until Ahithophel betrayed him. And because uh, of Jonathan's faithfulness to David. He wants to do something for Jonathan, but Jonathan is dead, so the best he can do is something for one of Jonathan's descendants. And so he asks if there's anyone left of Jonathan's descendants that he can show this kindness to. Now, here's something important. Look in that verse, and when David said, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul, or is there still anyone left of the house of the previous king? Every king asks this. Every single king asked the exact same question David is asking right here. Who is left of the previous king's house but so that I can do what? Execute them. David asked this question for the opposite reason. He wants to show kindness to this person that might be descended from Jonathan. And sometimes you could wonder, because of David's adultery and murder, why he's the man after God's own heart. But we're looking at one of those examples right here and seeing such an incredible contrast with the world or the custom, the way that things were typically done, that where the world would execute, David would show kindness or favor to his greatest threat. Verse 2, now there was a servant of the house of Saul, this is an important man, 
for the rest of our study, whose name was Ziba. And they called Ziba to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. So why did David have to do some investigating to find out if there was anyone still alive of the house of Saul or descended from Jonathan? Because they would all be hiding. They would all be afraid for their lives, knowing that they're of the house of the previous king. Now, Ziba, he used to be a servant in Saul's house. And so if because he previously served in Saul's house, if there would be anyone who would know if there were any descendants left of the house of Saul or specifically descended from Jonathan, it would be this man. And so he's brought before David, verse 3. David says to him, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. Doesn't even use Mephibosheth's name. And the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And so my suspicion is because of the uh, cruelty of the ancient world and Mephibosheth's handicapped state, he couldn't even live on his own. He had to live with this other man who would probably somewhat care for him. And then verse 5, King David sent and he brought him, brought Mephibosheth from the house of Maker, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And I just want you to notice here, David sent and brought him. David initiated. David reached out to Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was not seeking David. David sought Mephibosheth. And this brings us to lesson three. David sought Mephibosheth like God seeks us. Now, kind of going back to that idea of the world revolving around us, kind of going back to that idea of us being proud what do we want to think in our relationships with God that who chose who? Who sought who? There's just this fleshly proud part of us that wants to think that we're the initiators, that we woke up one day and just recognized our sinfulness and depravity and need for a Savior, and then suddenly we, the search was on for us to find a Savior for our sins. But listen to these verses, Romans 3.11, there is none who what? seeks after God. There has not been one single person who has ever sought after God. 1 John 4, 19, we love him for what reason? If you do love the Lord, you only love him because he first loved you. John 6, 44, Jesus said, no one can come to me unless what? The Father who sent me draws him. John 6, 65, no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father god had to grant for you god the father had to grant for you to come to faith in his son jesus christ you didn't seek god you didn't initiate or let me say it like this you sought god about as much as mephibosheth sought david that's how much you pursued him he pursued you. He reached down into your life. He stirred you up. He worked in your heart. You didn't wake yourself up out of your spiritually dead condition and go after God. He came after you. Unregenerate man seeks God about as much as Mephibosheth sought David. Look at verse 6. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, he came to David. And then look at this response. He fell on his face, and he pays homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth answered, Behold, I am your servant. And then David said to him, Do not fear. And just go ahead and pause right here for a moment. I, I've told you before, you'll get so much more joy out of reading the Bible if you picture what these accounts looked like. And I just want you to imagine this crippled, handicapped man, terrified for his life, coming in before David. We know he was terrified because David said what to him? He could, he could read the expression on his face, and he, and he understood probably before he, before he, David understood before he even saw Mephibosheth, how terrified he would be being brought here before the king like this, because it would have been completely um, improper for David's servants to go to Mephibosheth and tell him why he was being sought. We know that Mephibosheth did not know why he was being sought because if he knew why he was being sought, he wouldn't have been terrified. 
when he was before the king. We don't even know if the servants themselves would have known why Mephibosheth was being sought. Perhaps they, they thought that they were just bringing Mephibosheth for the same reason any king would bring a descendant of the previous king. And so he comes in, he's terrified, he falls on his face before the king, completely uh, unaware of the reality that David wants to show some kindness to him. He thinks he's going to die. Mephibosheth, I mean, you see the terror that Mephibosheth's nurse fell back in 2 Samuel 4 to try to get Mephibosheth to some place of safety. And so what has he been doing for all these years until this moment? He's been living quietly, knowing any day could be his last. He's, he's hoping to have this very low profile in the house of this, of this other man who's probably caring for him, under the impression that every day he draws breath could very well be his last. The servants are going to show up. They're going to knock on the door. They're going to bring me before the king, and I'm going to be executed because I am descended from Saul. And when the messengers arrive that day to bring him before King David, he knows what? That day has arrived. This is the day that I have dreaded, but perhaps he was thankful for the few years he'd been able to have, but he knows it's coming to an end the moment he finds himself before King David. But look how David responded in what would have been one of the most beautiful, one of the tenderest moments in the entire Old Testament. Verse 7, David says to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And can you imagine how Mephibosheth felt hearing this? And notice the words, I will show you kindness. You might not have noticed, but this is the third time in this account that we are told that David showed kindness to Mephibosheth. Also in verse 1, is there anyone of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake, verse 3, the king said, Is there still not someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And this brings us to lesson four. David showed Mephibosheth kindness because of Jonathan, like God shows us kindness because of Jesus. Look in verse 1. Is there anyone of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for what? For Jonathan's sake. Verse 7, David said, don't fear, I'll show you kindness. For what? For your father Jonathan, for his sake. David showed Mephibosheth kindness because of anything Mephibosheth had done? Because he earned it? Because he deserved it? What do we call unmerited or unearned kindness or unearned favor? What you're seeing here is David showing grace, extending grace to Mephibosheth. Now, similarly, God shows us kindness, or he extends grace to us because of what we've done, because we have earned it, because we have been so good, because we deserved it, because there was those times that, that we were so faithful to God. Is that why he's shown us kindness? No, he has shown us kindness for the sake of Jesus. Mephibosheth was shown kindness because of what someone else had done, and that was Jonathan. You are shown kindness or favor or grace because of what someone else has done, and that's Jesus. Briefly turn to the left of 1 Samuel 20. 1 Samuel 20. And I want to stress this while you turn there because there's just that lingering fleshly part of us that we never seem to be rid of, always convincing us that God is being good to us for what reason? Because we're good. Because we deserve it. Because we're so much better than everyone else who is not receiving the same favor or kindness or grace from him. But if that was the case and we had deserved it, or it was merited versus unmerited, then it would not be what? <laughs> because what is it when you work for it? It is wages. 1 Samuel 20, verse 15, or 14. Jonathan said to David, Do not 
cut off your steadfast love. This is Jonathan talking to David. Do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. What was Jonathan doing right here? He's interceding. He's interceding for all of those that he would what? See saved. He's interceding for his descendants. David, spare them, please. Spare them for me. Do not unleash your wrath on them. Spare them for my sake, for me, because of your love and your affection for me. And that is why God has done what he's done for you. That is why the Father has extended love to you because of what Christ has done on your behalf, because he interceded. He still intercedes for you at the right hand of the Father and says, be kind to Scott. Extend favor to him. He does not deserve it. I am interceding for him because of what I have done for Scott up here. Show him favor. Show him grace. Do not execute him. Do not unleash on him the wrath that his sins deserve. You breathe today. You draw any breath you do because God is being gracious to you, because he's being patient. Your sins and my sins have all deserved death by now. Did Mephibosheth earn or merit this kindness? Not at all. It was grace. Mephibosheth condemned to die. There was nothing he could do to save himself, but he was saved by grace because of what someone else did for him. Similarly, we are condemned to die. There's nothing that we could do to save ourselves. If you learned about the judgment that's against you, could you ever work hard enough to avoid the wrath of God? Could you ever work hard enough to avoid the punishment that your sins deserve? No, absolutely not. There's nothing you can do except cry out to Christ for mercy. There's nothing you can do but fall on your face like Mephibosheth did and ask God to be merciful to you, a sinner, like in Luke 18 with that sinner in the, in the temple who bangs on his chest. Be merciful to me, Lord, because of what Christ has done. There's nothing that I could do to avoid the judgment that I deserve. And when Mephibosheth learns this incredible news, look how he responds. Back in 2 Samuel 9, verse 8, he paid homage, and he said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? And let me just ask you, who else should be saying this? about their spiritual condition? We should. Why me, Lord? Why would you choose me? Why would you show me favor? Why would you allow me to be saved? What have I done to deserve this? And the answer is nothing. I don't know why. I mean, what, what, in the ancient world, we have dogs as pets, but in the ancient world, few things were as contemptible as a dog. The only thing worse than a, do, a, dead, a living dog was a dead dog. And so Mephibosheth, he goes beyond just a living dog, which, was, which were already uh, received an amount of contempt, to refer to himself as a dead dog. And he says, why would you do this for me? Why would you save me? Why would you extend your kindness to me like this? And you notice there's no answer given here other than because of what Jonathan has done for you. And that's the same for us. It's because of what Jesus has done for us. We receive the kindness from the Father, and we can't give any answer associated with our efforts or our work. We can't say, well, I did this, and that's why God is kind to me, or I did this, and that's why God saved me. David's kindness doesn't stop there. Look at verse 9. The king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and he said to him, all that belong to Saul and to all his house, I have given to your master's grandson, and you, so let me be clear about what's happening here, so this might sound confusing because there's a lot of pronouns. Basically, David is giving to Mephibosheth everything that belonged to whom? Saul's house, everything that belonged to Jonathan. Considering Saul was a king, this would have been a considerable amount. And he tells this to Ziba, who was supposed to be Saul and Jonathan's servant. Verse 10, and then he tells Ziba, he says, you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for Mephibosheth. You shall work for him, be his servant, bring in produce, that your master's grandson, that Jonathan's, or that Saul's grandson, Mephibosheth, may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. So Mephibosheth just learned 
that Ziba, along with Ziba's 15 sons and 20 servants, are becoming his servants, and he will now spend his days eating at the king's table. And I want to explain why this is such an entertaining scene. I I wish I had more time. Ziba was the servant or steward of Saul's house, which means he was put in charge of all of Saul and then uh, Jonathan's possessions. When Saul and Jonathan died, what Ziba should have done was he should have taken all that belonged to the house of Saul, and he should have given it to the next descendant of the house of Saul, which was Mephibosheth. My suspicion is because he knew that Mephibosheth was crippled and posed absolutely no threat to him. What did Ziba decide to do with everything that belonged to the house of Saul? He kept it all for himself. He gave none of it to Mephibosheth like he was supposed to. But right here, Ziba learns that everything that he has been keeping for himself that should have went to Mephibosheth is actually going to Mephibosheth now. Ziba is a dishonorable, shameful man. He, he is a, a blemish uh, in, this, in 2 Samuel. Uh, he was a selfish man, and it is wonderful to see justice being done here where Mephibosheth has to give to, Meph- or where Ziba has to give to Mephibosheth everything that belonged. Did I say Ziba was a blemish or did I say Mephibosheth was? Okay, very good. I don't want to mix that up. Excuse me if I did. But Ziba is a dishonorable, shameful man, and I enjoy seeing him have to give to Mephibosheth everything that belonged to Mephibosheth here. And then for Ziba and his 15 sons and 20 servants having to serve Mephibosheth for the rest of their lives, Ziba goes along with it, I'm guessing very reluctantly. Look at verse 11. Ziba said to the king, and I almost picture him saying this through clenched teeth, According to all that my lord, the king, commands his servant, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at the king's table like one of the king's sons. And notice the end of this verse. It says, like one of the king's sons. And this brings us to lesson five. Mephibosheth was adopted by the king like we are adopted by the king. Mephibosheth was adopted by the king like we are adopted by the king. Now, earlier when I said you're not David and you're not Elijah, you didn't really want to be Mephibosheth, did you? But now you want to be Mephibosheth. See, I can't even say it. Now you want to be Mephibosheth, don't you? When you see what? God's grace. When you see God's kindness to you, suddenly being a wretched, crippled, fallen individual doesn't look so bad when God's grace is applied to it. Mephibosheth ended up being adopted into the king's family. Who else is adopted into the king's family? Every believer. Every person who became a Christian became part of God's family, like one of his sons or daughters. John 1.12, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Galatians 3.26, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 1 John 3, one. behold, what manner of love. Almost the way Mephibosheth spoke, you hear John saying this. He says, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. And it's an incredibly beautiful picture, isn't it? You have this wretched individual who deserves death. He's brought before the king, expecting to be executed, and he ends up being made into one of the king's sons. And when you see the beauty of it, here's what you need to know. It is exactly what transpires in the life of every single believer who has done what? Repented of their sins and put their faith in Christ. Look at verse 12. Mephibosheth, he had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So everyone associated with Ziba began serving Mephibosheth. Verse 13, so Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. And I want you to notice something. As much as David's kindness to Mephibosheth is a a theme, one of the other themes through the account is eating at the king's table. Look in verse 7. Look at the end of verse 7. You shall eat at my table always. The end of verse 10, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson shall always eat at my table. Verse, toward the end of verse 11, Mephibosheth ate at David's table. And then verse 13, he always ate at the king's table. And if you write in your Bible, 
go ahead and circle always ate at the king's table and write Luke 14, 12 to 13. Circle always ate at the king's table and write Luke 14, 12 to 13. Do you see how beautifully David fulfilled Christ's words before Christ preach them. I mean, what does it mean to say that David is a man after God's own heart, except that there's some semblance, some way in which he looks like God or reveals the heart of God? And one of the beautiful things with David, despite all of his failures, is he repeatedly fulfilled the words of Christ before Christ ever came to earth and preached them. And this is one of those instances. Luke 14, 12, Jesus said, when you give a dinner or a banquet do not invite your friends or your brothers or relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. When you give a feast, you need to invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And that's exactly what David did. You guys want to know why you're real fortunate? You're fortunate that I preached this sermon this Sunday and not last Sunday. Or, or Thanksgiving, you guys wouldn't have had any family or friends there, would you? <laughs> You'd have been looking for every single person that, that uh, is crippled or lame, and your Thanksgivings might have looked completely different. But we can still at least definitely start applying these verses to our lives now, because the idea is just look to bless those people that can't bless you in return. That's the main point of this. Look to be kind to those people that you don't expect can be kind to you in return, and we see David doing that because there was no way that Mephibosheth was going to be able to repay this kindness. In the entirety of the Old Testament, Mephibosheth would have been probably the least likely person to be able to do anything for David in response to what David has done for him. The rest of verse 13, it says, he was lame in both of his feet. One of the things whenever we talk about types like this, I tell you that they fall short. In other words, if you're listening to me ever teach on a type, you could come to me after and you could say, hey, Pastor Scott, you know, it breaks down at this point. And I would say, yeah, it definitely breaks down. If the type never broke down, then what? It would be the reality. It would have the substance. It would have, or in the language of Colossians or, or Hebrews, it would have the substance or reality to it. So it has to break down. And you're seeing the breakdown here when it mentions Mephibosheth's lameness. In other words, you go further than this. He comes up short he had to remain the rest of his life here as a cripple. His handicap did not go away. What are you going to receive? What's going to happen to your handicap? What's going to happen to your disease or your sickness? What's going to happen to your affliction? You're going to receive what? You're going to receive a glorified body. Your lameness will be taken away. There will be no more sickness for you. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment... In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And so I'll say this. What David did for Mephibosheth, I mean, it's incredible. It is wonderful. But what? What Christ does for you is that much greater it pales in comparison what Mephibosheth experienced to what we experience. What King David did for Mephibosheth pales in comparison to what King Jesus does for us. We receive grace, we receive divine favor that far exceeds even the kindness that was shown to Mephibosheth. And I want to show you something interesting. Turn to the left to 2 Samuel 5. Let me give you the, and this sermon is going to be a little longer, so just try to stay with me, because I think I, do, I want to get it into one sermon. But if I get in one sermon, that sermon ends up being a little longer sometimes. Now, in 2 Samuel 5, here's the context. David has come to Jerusalem to make it his capital, but it's still occupied. Uh, when Joshua brought the tribes into the land, the Jebusites occupied what became Jerusalem and they, it was called Jebus, and they re continued occupying it until David's day. And so the tribes under Joshua's leadership had not driven out all the Canaanites, and these were some of those Canaanites that were completely lodged in the city of Jerusalem, or, at this or what was previously known as Jebus. And so when David comes to Jerusalem, these, these Jebusites who were in Jerusalem or in Jebus are feeling pretty what about David thinking that he's going to come and dislodge them? 
How do they feel? You can't do, you can't touch us. We've been here for centuries. I mean, it was Joshua came. None of the tribes could drive us out. This is our place. We don't move. You can get the whole rest of the promised land and we stay here. Nobody dislodges us. That's what the Jebusites think. With that in mind, look in verse 6. 2 Samuel 5, verse 6. The king, this is David, his men, they went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites who were in Jerusalem and the inhabitants of the land. And they said to David, they said, you will not come in here. The blind and the lame will ward you off, thinking David cannot come in here. Verse 7. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David, another name for Jerusalem, or two names, Zion, city of David, are names for Jerusalem. Verse 8, David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind who were hated by David's soul. Therefore it is said, okay, this is the important part, therefore it is said, which means it became a saying, it became a saying in David's day, the blind and the lame shall not come into this house referring to Jerusalem. And so because of this exchange between David and the Jebusites, it became a proverb or a well-known saying that the blind and the lame would not enter Jerusalem. And this brings us to lesson six. King David brought Mephibosheth into Jerusalem like King Jesus brings the spiritually lame into the new Jerusalem. King David brought Mephibosheth into Jerusalem like King Jesus brings the spiritually lame into the new Jerusalem. Let me just back up a moment to get some momentum into this lesson so that it makes sense. The New Testament identifies the earthly Jerusalem as a type of the heavenly Jerusalem or the new Jerusalem. Galatians 4.26, the Jerusalem above is free. Hebrews 12.22, you've come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Revelation 3.12, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven. You say, well, I thought Jerusalem's on earth. There's the earthly Jerusalem, which serves as a picture or type of the heavenly Jerusalem or new Jerusalem that comes out of heaven. Revelation 21.2 and 9, the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Okay, now hold on to that. The Old Testament prophesied that under the Messiah, when the Messiah came, who was going to be shown special favor? The blind and the lame. Isaiah 35, 6, when the Messiah comes, the lame shall leap like a deer. Jeremiah 31, 8, behold, I will gather Israel from the ends of the earth, among them the blind and the lame. Okay, now let me connect the dots here. 2 Samuel 5 tells us the blind and the lame were excluded from Jerusalem, which is a picture or type of heaven. When King David brings Mephibosheth into Jerusalem, it prefigures King Jesus bringing the spiritually lame, us, into the new Jerusalem, which is why you should see yourself as Mephibosheth. Or let me say it like this. When David brought Mephibosheth into Jerusalem, it's a beautiful picture of Jesus bringing into the new Jerusalem the spiritually blind and lame who have him as their king. So if Christ is your king, you will be ushered into the new Jerusalem as much as Mephibosheth was ushered into the earthly Jerusalem. Now, there's one more event with Mephibosheth and Ziba that I want to show you. Turn to 2 Samuel 16. 2 Samuel 16. Here's the context. In one of the lowest moments of David's life, his son Absalom took the throne from him, and he had to flee Jerusalem for his life. Can you imagine that? Your son takes the throne from you, wants to murder you, and you're the king, and you're forced to flee the capital. And when David is fleeing, someone comes out to meet him. It happened to be Ziba. And Ziba has not gotten over what? What has he not been able to move on from? All of the stuff that wasn't really his stuff being given to Mephibosheth. So he sees David being crushed by all of the burdens of his life at this moment and decides, Ziba decides that he's going to take advantage of David. And so he comes to David and he brings him all of these supplies to win David's favor because David has just fled the capital and uh, 
it happened very quickly. He wasn't able to prepare or bring supplies. So Ziba brings these supplies to David to win David's favor. And sadly, it sort of worked. And Ziba wants to get David to turn against who? Mephibosheth. Ziba catches David, tries to win David's favor, and get David to turn against Mephibosheth. And tragically, it worked. It was a, he lied to him, but David believed it, probably because of all the stress that David was under at this time. Have you ever been really stressed out as a parent, and it's harder to parent or make decisions? That's how I picture David in this moment. Your children are coming to you, and you just say something rash, and then you have to apologize later. That's kind of what David's going through right here, and so he makes this very rash decision. Look in verse 1. David passed a little beyond the summit, and Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met David with a couple of donkeys that were saddled, bearing 200 loaves of bread, a hundred bunches of, bunches of raisins. He brings them all this food, some summer fruits, a skin of wine. Verse 2, and David said to Ziba, why have you brought these? And Ziba answered, the donkeys are for the king's household, for your people to ride on, the bread and summer fruit are for the young men to eat, and the wine for those who faint in the wilderness to drink. Verse 3, and then David said, where is your master's son? When David saw Ziba, he noticed someone was missing. And who's that? Where's Mephibosheth? Why would you be here, but Mephibosheth, your master, is not here? So look what Ziba says. Oh, behold, David, Mephibosheth remains in Jerusalem, for he said, and this is a lie, well, today the house of Israel is going to be given back to the kingdom of my father, which would be who? Saul. And so it could have seemed very reasonable that Mephibosheth would want the throne to return to the house of Saul because that was Mephibosheth's house. Verse 4, and then the king said to Ziba, look at this, behold, all that belonged to Mephibosheth is now yours. And Ziba said, I pay homage. Let me ever find favor in your sight, my lord the king. So everything that Mephibosheth had been given by David is now given back to Ziba because Ziba deceived David. Now turn to 2 Samuel 19. And while you turn there, understand this. Because of Mephibosheth's handicap, it was difficult for him to do what? Probably just about anything, but in particular, travel. He wanted to get out to his king. He wanted to reach David. He wanted to be with him. But he couldn't because of his handicap and it seems because Ziba had actually stolen his donkey. But he finally catches up with David. Mephibosheth catches up with David after all of Mephibosheth's stuff has been given to Ziba. Look in verse 24. Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king, to meet David. And look at this. Mephibosheth had neither taken care of his feet, he had not trimmed his beard, he had not washed his clothes from the day that the king departed until the day he came back in safety. Why does Mephibosheth look this way? He can't eat. He can't take care of himself because he's so overwhelmed with concern for his king. He's so worried about David, he cannot stop to care for himself. Verse 25, when he came to Jerusalem to meet the king, David said to him, why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? A very reasonable question. I brought you to my table. I made you like one of my sons. I gave you everything that belonged to the house of Saul and Jonathan, where have you been? Why did you not come with me when everyone close to me came? Why were you not there? Plus, David will remember what Ziba said to him a few chapters earlier. And so look what Mephibosheth says. My Lord, O king, my servant, referring to Ziba, he deceived me. For your servant, I said to him, he's speaking in the third person, I said to Ziba, I will saddle a donkey for myself, that I may ride on it and go with the king, for your servant is lame. So apparently Mephibosheth had told Ziba, I will saddle my donkey, I will prepare it so that I can go out and be with the king. But what happened? 
Seems like Ziba took it himself. Verse 27, he has slandered your servant to my lord the king, but my lord the king is like the angel of God. Do therefore what seems good to you. For all my father's house were but men doomed to death. I was doomed to die. Everyone was to be executed before you, but you set your servant among those who would eat at your table. What further right have I then to cry to the king? Verse 29, and the king said to him, why speak any more of your affairs? I have, I have when we think about how much more our, I have when we think about how much more our decided you and Ziba shall divide the land. So right here, Mephibosheth learns that half of all the stuff he's lost because of Ziba's treachery is going to be given back to him, but that's it. In other words, let me just make this real clear. This isn't favorable. This is not a very good scenario for Mephibosheth. He, he didn't get what most of us would desire. Everything is not made right. The world did not suddenly become just to him. But look at this response in verse 30. And this is our last verse for this morning. Mephibosheth said to the king, Let him take it all, since my lord the king has come safely home. I don't care if I have anything else. Ziba can keep all of it as long as I have what? Christ. If I can just have my king, if I don't have anything else, nothing else in the world matters to me as long as I have my king who has shown me favor. You would expect Mephibosheth to be sad about everything he's lost. You would expect him to be upset with Ziba because of the way that Ziba has slandered him. You'd even expect Ziba or Mephibosheth to be upset or angry with David for making such a rash decision and believing the slander or the lies that Ziba told him. He doesn't care about any of that. He only cared about one thing, and what was that? The well-being of his king. Mephibosheth was content to let Ziba have everything if he could just have his king. His relationship with David was more important to him than anything physically he could own or any mistreatment he received or any slander against him, any lies that were told. Knowing David was okay was all he wanted, and it is really beautiful and should be a great challenge to us, especially when we consider how much greater kindness or favor King Jesus has shown us than King David showed Mephibosheth. And I mention this because when we think about how much more Jesus has done for us than David did for Mephibosheth, how much more affection should we have for our king? How much easier should we be able to say, let them have everything, let anything else happen as long as I have my king, as long as I have Christ? I will be up front after service. If you have any questions about anything I shared this morning or I can pray for you in any way, I consider it a privilege to speak with you. Father, I thank you for this account with Mephibosheth. I thank you for the dramatic picture he is of us and our condition, what he was physically, we are spiritually. And we thank you that what David did for Mephibosheth, King Jesus, does a, is in an even greater way for us, Lord. And so give us appreciation for what has been done for us, how we have been made one of the, your sons and that we will eat at your table. They're the marriage supper of the Lamb, we look forward to that, Lord. And so... I thank you for this account this morning, the beautiful type with Mephibosheth. I thank you for the instruction from Christ to look for those less fortunate that we can invest in, not for any other reason than because of what Jesus has invested in us. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.